Pate Mode with the Taito Mini. More about this and other stories on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Taito climb aboard the mini train. Nintendo drops the hammer, bros. The Super Nintendo gets wide. And no one can stop Mrs. Dynamite. All this and our community question of the week in This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. Choo choo, John. The minis train <laughs> rumbles on, and this time it's stopping at a little town called Taito. Pajaco6502 shared this story with us on our subreddit, and it's another mini arcade cabinet release. But before you dismiss it and skip to the next story, just hang on there because I think, you know, we're probably all starting to get mini fatigue now, but mm-hmm. this does actually have some thoughtful choices and nice features included in it at least in my opinion it does anyway dare i say it john the competition in the mini market might actually be forcing manufacturers to innovate and make their particular mini stand out from the crowd here's hoping on the face of it the taito egret 2 mini and i must say every time i say taito john and i were just discussing this before the show we grew up saying Tato, tato didn't we yeah. tato yeah. because we didn't know any better that's we just said it as we saw potato it. potato <laughs> so <laughs> i have to sort of take a, a millisecond to recalibrate my brain every time i say it tato this is the tato egret 2 mini very similar in style to sega's astro city mini cab the egret 2 being the name of the full-sized cabinet it's based on and it's one of those gigantic white plastic sit-down arcades where you've got the the huge screen and the big control panel in front of you. Yeah, really quite would, a big. They arcade. call them they, they call them candy cabs. Candy cabs. Okay, that's the umbrella they all fall under, isn't mm-hmm. it? The Astro City and the Egret too. Um, so I don't quite know where Egret comes into it because that's the name of a bird, isn't it? So, it is. It is. I, I don't know I, why they choose that, but it is one of the uh, more sought after candy cabs. I've been on these have been on my radar for a long time. The problem is, is the price has gotten out of control. You have to import these from Japan because they were never really released in the United States. And what people do is they actually organize, um, you know, shipping containers full of these things to ship over. That's the only way that you can possibly make it cost effective. So if you know 20 or 30 other people that also want a candy cab, you can get one for a couple thousand bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, you're going to be paying them. the big money. They, they are a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've seen them listed for at the moment. I, can't, I don't think I've seen one in the wild. I've seen plenty of the Sega um, Astro city cabs but not an egret too Mm -hmm. yeah Um, not knowingly anyway so very different to that first generation wooden arcade style uh, and we're very much in the 90s period here with these one of the features of the egret 2 which made life easy for arcade operators was that the screen could be neatly rotated if you had a vertical shooter in your cab for example or you could spin it back around to the horizontal orientation for other games that wasn't unique to the cabinet That, that was in plenty of older cabinets I remember I bought one once and it had this big wooden wheel inside that the monitor was mounted in and you would unclip it and spin the whole thing around. But it's done (laughs) nice and neatly inside this cab. Very easy for arcade operators. And that feature has carried through into the mini cab. So you can pop the screen out, you can twist it and you can pop it back in really quickly and easily. And I think that's a really cool feature. I think that's a great selling point for this. You've also got a six button control panel so there's no compromises there. And you can get an external joypad which has on it a mini trackball and a spinner for those bat and ball games, those breakout clones. And uh, there's also an optional second control panel and joypad for player two. So a lot of bases covered there, John. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm really excited about the mini trackball and spinner because that is something that we haven't really seen before on one of these mini consoles. And with games like Arkanoid, that's what you need. You know, uh, uh, Taito's been one of my favorite uh, producers of video games for forever. Uh, you got Bubble Bobble, Chase HQ, and of course Arkanoid. Uh, all those I still play all the time. I still think that they have an age today. Now, what games are included in this particular mini cabinet? Well, uh, first up, I should point out that this is a Japanese exclusive release at oh. the moment, John. So. Oh. You're either going to need to import one alongside your full-sized Egret 2 <laughs> <laughs> or, um, you know, sit tight and we'll see if we get a Western release. There are, they're saying there's going to be 40 games. I haven't seen a full list yet, but I have seen a, a condensed list which includes Space Invaders, of course. Uh, it goes all the way through to Rainbow Islands, New Zealand Story, 
bubble bobble elevator action like you say all of those games that i kind of gravitate towards whenever i run an arcade emulator because mm-hmm. they are just such classic games um Funnily enough, though, the Egret 2 cabinet, the original one, came out in 1996. So a lot of these games actually predate the style of cabinet which they've put it in, which is kind of funny uh, if you're a stickler for authenticity. But because the cabinet had a a 27-inch screen originally, the whole design of it does lend itself well to being scaled down while maintaining an angle on the screen that you can actually look at in mini form uh, without losing the distinctive dimensions of the cabinet. So I understand why they did it. It makes sense. Now, there's an additional SD card that comes with the cabinet if you get the paddle and the trackball um, controller with paddle and trackball games on, obviously. So that does open up the question of is it possible to put other ROMs on that SD card and run more games than are included or perhaps they'll sell additional ROM packs on SD cards. I'm not sure. I'm sure the hackers will answer that question for us on day one, if not before. They'll figure that out pretty quickly. Uh, it's it's putting quite a big target on this machine's back to accept SD cards. Oh, yeah. So we'll find out. Um, but the games with the trackball and spinner, it does include Arkanoid and Arkanoid Returns, Strike Bowling. also includes a game called Plump Pop, which I had to look at. Uh, and it turns out this is an incredibly cute game in the style of a breakout clone. But instead of a bat... Your two dogs holding a trampoline, bouncing other animals into things to smash them up. <laughs> so there we go. Did you ever launch a dog on a trampoline, John? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that kind of thing is going to get you arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the 80s, apparently. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it was and, anything uh, yeah. goes in the trampoline scene back then. Anything went. Anything went. Not something I did, personally, I must say. But um, yeah, I, I, like the, I like the game. I like the concept. So there's around 40 games for this as i said with the capability to add more perhaps we'll get some official packs of additional games but uh, as it stands it comes in at 170 dollars uh if we go by the exchange rates that's about 120 pounds that's for the main unit 30 dollars or 21 pounds for the gamepad 80 dollars or 56 pounds if you want an additional arcade stick for player two that's quite steep or you can go all in throw $450 or £317 at it for the collector's pack with everything in there, your spinner, your second control pad, everything and a few extra trinkets thrown in. And just to put that into some kind of perspective, that is actually more expensive than a PlayStation 4 Pro right now with a one terabyte drive. So um, value for money, John? What do you think? Uh, I mean, of course not. Of course it's a horrible value. I mean, you can play (laughs) any of these games, uh, you know, on your computer right now for nothing. But... You can't put a price on nostalgia, and you can't put a price on people's adoration of Japanese arcade culture. Uh, this is if you're involved in the scene at all, uh, either you or many people you know uh, love Japanese arcade games, and especially candy cabs. They're so expensive these days. If you're not going to find a candy cab, a full size candy cab for 450 bucks, I'll tell you that right now. So, uh, and let's not forget that a major factor in buying any of these mini console, you know, whatevers is the cool thing on a shelf factor, you know, where you put this on your shelf in your game room or your bedroom or whatever, and you look at it as you go in and out, and it just kind of makes you feel good. So, it's almost like a piece of, of, of furniture or a piece of art. So, with the price of real arcade games going through the roof, you know, these mini machines, though they are expensive, when you look at it in the context of do i buy this or do i buy a full-size machine they actually do represent a pretty good value in a small attractive package i think yeah i mean like you say the the cost of the cabinets right now it's probably cheaper to buy a a shrinking ray and shrink yourself down than it would be to buy a cabinet to get the right size (laughs) um but yeah if you if you assess these things purely on technical merit you're right they don't stand up to much price wise um they aren't giving you anything much more than you can easily knock up with a pie or or an old laptop or whatever you want to use in fact they they limit your choice of games by only letting you play what's on them but as you say if you treat it as an object first as a functional little piece of nostalgic art that you want to collect if you've got a few and you build up a little mini arcade all playing their attract sounds then i get that i get that that's nice um still a little bit rich for my blood at this price but we'll see we'll see Um, you know I'd almost like them to just release the cabinet as a shell so that I can put what I want inside that a shell and a monitor that nice rotating monitor I'd quite like that but uh, I can't see them doing that anytime soon 
Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. the Sega Astro City Mini did start out in Japan only, and then it did get a release in the UK and uh, internationally. So hopefully the, the Taito Egret 2 Mini will follow suit. Uh, maybe they'll make it a little bit more affordable. Don't know. But no doubt we will see some regional differences in the games list if that does happen. So it'll be interesting to see what changes. I haven't seen Chase HQ mentioned. I'd be surprised if it's not on there. Uh, perhaps even as a spinner game so you can use the spinner as as the steering wheel that would be not a bad idea yeah 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 so we'll see what happens japanese release date is currently march of 2022 and all the links and this to other stories to discuss today can be found in the show notes neil when you're in need for a quick amiga fix what's your go-to game Oh, more often than not, it's Turrican 2. I, I quite often go towards that, as much for the music as for the game, John. Oh, yeah, that sweet, sweet Huselbeck soundtrack. Uh, for <laughs> me, it's got to be a, a quick game of Parasol Stars. You know, it's such a great game. It's a wonder to me why it didn't actually get an arcade release. We're just talking about arcade machines. Uh, but if you out there want to get a quick hit of Amiga action on your PC, there's no easier way to do it than with Amiga Forever. It's a complete turnkey emulation system that includes all the Kickstart files and games that you need right out of the gate, and everything's completely licensed and legit. You can check out their wide array of packages starting at just 10 bucks over at AmigaForever.com. A big thank you to Amiga Forever for sponsoring This Week in Retro. Neil, we all know the old saying, crime doesn't pay. But we know that's not always the case. So, Neil, what kinds of quasi-legal rackets were you running back in your schoolyard days? I'm talking about good old-fashioned software piracy mania. Uh, You can save all of your other criminal mastermind stories (laughs) for another episode. (laughs) Oh, yeah, John. It was like West Side Story in my playground. (laughs) Just like it. You had the ZX Spectrum gang. You Mm -hmm. had the C64 gang in another corner. I was mixing with the bad crowd. I was in the Amstrad CPC crew. Oh, and, the wrong uh, side of the my, tracks. Oh, yeah, <laughs> wrong side of the tracks. And as my dad had a tape-to-tape hi-fi, you know, I had status. Mm. I had power. Um, <laughs> and we'd exchange pirated cassettes, allegedly, with, uh, you know, slick handshakes in front of the dinner ladies. They didn't suspect a thing. We had it down, John. But um, I should say that no money exchanged hands, you know. It was just for the love of the sport in the playground for me. Yeah, yeah, I was the same way. Wouldn't I? I mean, I never really got into piracy for profit either. Uh, of course, all the software I had for computers was pirated, but I was never on a BBS or an internet connection fast enough to get into a lot of the trading or outright selling of pirated games that, that often went on. Uh, it really wasn't until college came around and Napster dawned on the horizon that I really became a full-fledged sailor on the pirate seas. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> at that point, you know, everybody was on a high-speed connection, everybody had Napster, and everybody had everything. So even if I wanted to profit off my illegal deeds, there was there was no profit to be made there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Napster in its original form, uh, we're going a bit off, off tangent from ROMs here into music, but it was a beautiful thing. It was a real moment of seeing just what it meant for technology to be light years ahead of the industry yeah um in this case the music industry it's amazing how long it took for the industry to actually catch up with it because it delivered something that we wanted so badly um that they just couldn't get their head around it and napster sparked a lot of my interest that carries through today in music it really did ignite something for me as too did discovering roms and emulators for classic arcade games way back in the mid 90s um, I was would have been doing this on my dial-up internet connection on my PC. And it was over dial-up that I first got access to the Neo Geo games library. Outside of an arcade, of course, because we did have Neo Geo cabs. But um, I didn't have access to all of the games in the library, just what was at the arcade. So it was really exciting to explore them. And I also had the old family TV plugged into an S-video port on my the computer. The big telly. So, yeah, the big telly. I had it. I, well, the big telly that we didn't use anymore because we'd oh. upgraded. So <laughs> I, I dragged that up to my room, had it in the S video output on my PC, had an arcade joystick hooked up to it. And so suddenly I had the ability to download and discover what was a very exotic system for me in, in a pretty authentic feeling way with the CRT, um, with the scan lines, with an arcade stick. 
you know, it was really exciting. So um, were you doing the same around about then? Mid-90s? Actually, no. You know, I definitely knew about ROMs and I definitely knew about emulation. I remember downloading Nesticle, you know, in the mid 90s and trying it out. But um, even though I was, you know, into the classic gaming scene and I knew lots of people that were through Internet boards and things like that, I just always preferred collecting cartridges. Um, I think it was a combination of the fact that I was mainly a console player at the time. And if you were into consoles, there weren't a whole lot of great solutions in terms of controllers that could mimic the feel of, you know, a Super Nintendo pad. I know that you, Neil, I know you PC gamers, you PC gamers, wax nostalgic about the original Gravis gamepad. But compared to a Nintendo or even a Mega Drive controller, I mean, those things were pure garbage, uh, unless it was your first experience with the D-pad-like design, which I'm sure for a lot of people it was, and there's there's nostalgia there. But, but anyway, I didn't get started into the whole mass downloading of ROMs thing until well after college when I moved to Thailand in, in like 2009. It was actually none other than Amigo Aaron who built me a sweet all-in-one emulation box based on an HP Thin client that could run everything up to and including the N64 that I witnessed the true power of emulation for the first time. Plus, controllers by that point, of course, had achieved parity. So, how about you, Neil? Uh, Who first turned you on to the world of shady software? I'm tempted to say Amigo Aaron as well, just to drop him in it. As, as yeah. on the topic. Let's just throw it all at him. <laughs> he's, he's the dark the dark mind behind everything related to piracy. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, the, those early pay, playground days, which I joked about, they progressed as I moved into 16-bit ownership. And uh, some of the older lads that I knew in town, they had much more professional setups than I had. They had modems on their, on their Amigas. They had floppy drives lots and lots of floppy drives all lined up and funnily enough it was the lads in the more affluent areas of town um who who seemed to be up to it i remember there was one who had free reign of the upstairs of this large victorian house and uh he just had pirated software and boxes of discs everywhere Mm. in this house and he charged me 50p a disc i think it was something like that and i'd head across town wait for him to copy them and he was my my main source of software. He was my man for games before I managed to get online myself. But I should point out that I did pretty much spend every single penny that I saved buying boxed games in town, buying original games. Mm-hmm. Um, not that that's an excuse for piracy, but you know, I, I needed my gaming fix however I could get it through fair means or foul. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and also we would of, we would often see here in the UK all of those threats in computer magazines for the federation against software theft you know dobbing your mates the police are going to come and kick down the door for all the threats that we saw in the magazines i never once saw or heard of anyone hit getting hit at the time getting their door kicked in um, you know the the, the so, people that you always hear about are the people like your supplier you know that <laughs> that have a whole house dedicated yeah. to the the art of copying discs but if you were a small time player i don't think you really had anything to worry about other than just the feeling of guilt as you read through those magazine ads which i'm sure was little to none exactly but, yeah guilt guilt was the main weapon i think it really was but yeah. it, if it, it, in reality it was it was a bit of a free for all yeah and i mean when you're a kid you just you want to play all the games and the amount of money that you have does not allow you to buy all the games so i was sort of like you i would buy stuff when i could but um when i when i couldn't i resorted to other means so but when you're in the rom shilling business neil sometimes the law comes down hard And that's what happened this week to a website known as ROM Universe. Uh, The site's operator, a Los Angeles resident named Matthew Storman, established the site a decade ago and not only uploaded and hosted ROMs from a variety of systems, but he profited, Neil, get this, to the tune of around $30,000 a year just based on ads and subscription revenues to the site. So not a bad little sum for hosting some files on your server. Uh, Unfortunately, the time has come to pay the piper. Earlier last week, a judge ruled in favor of the mighty Nintendo who brought suit against the site and its owner. And uh, Mr. Storman looks to be paying over $2 million to the big N. Uh, What do you think, Neil? Do you think that that's an excessive sum? I think when you consider how many downloads must have taken place on that site, $2 million sounds like he, he got off lightly, to be honest. Um, I can't remember the the last time I actually used a ROM website 
to be honest they've been going downhill for quite some time mm-hmm. uh, partly because they're absolutely spammed with adverts which is yeah. how he was clearly making his money there um perhaps with the exception of archive.org who, who seem to be able to host pretty much anything they want under the name of preservation so there, mm-hmm. there's still lots of roms kicking around on there and rom sets but uh, i think most people are either using private ftp servers or or rom packs shared via torrents these days um so yeah roms on websites i think their days are numbered but in, in this particular example two million dollars i'm surprised i think i i thought they would have made a even bigger example well i know that nintendo's original when they originally brought suit and this has been a couple of years ago now they wanted something like 10 times that amount and then the judge okay. reduced the figure so yeah they were after more and uh and they, they just didn't get it but uh, as we all know, uh, they, like you said, the, the demise of ROM universe has not brought about the end of web, websites offering ROMs for download. I think Internet Archive is probably uh, now uh, the, the place to go uh, to get whatever you want. They, they seem to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to ignore all laws and, and, and basically host whatever they feel like. Uh, in fact, you can swing a cat and hit 50 or 60 uh, ROM websites without trying. So these are still out there. I think that they prey upon people that are just getting in into the scene, especially these more shady sites, they make you believe that you need to click through all these ads and and, and pay a subscription fee to get what you want. Uh, and uh, obviously, they're they're still doing pretty well because there's still a ton of them. But uh, what's the answer to this? You know, how do you put the toothpaste back in the tube? How does the games industry rid itself of the scourge of people profiting off work that isn't really their own? Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, there's even websites out there at the moment where if you search for a ROM. It will, it will pretend that it's got that wrong, but it will give you a, a virus-infected yeah. executable instead. Yeah. Um, and you look on the free ad sites uh, or even eBay, there are lots of systems like Pi systems in a case that you can buy with thousands of ROMs on there. There, there doesn't seem to be any consequences to it. The They're all over that's Amazon, crazy. that's for sure. Yeah, They're all over yeah. Amazon. Yeah, you know, you buy one of those um, big arcade sticks. Um, the Pandora we, and all that, yeah. The Pandora, just loaded with ROMs. Um, yeah, but it takes us all the way back to Napster, doesn't it? In that convenience is king. Um, and uh, Napster absolutely proved that you have to fight convenience by being even more convenient. That's what the record industry tried to do eventually, whether they got as convenient as that original Napster or not is debatable, but that's the only way to fight it. Uh, you've got to be convenient and you've got to be indispensable, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I've always thought that the reason why Napster took off wasn't just because the tracks were free. It was just easier to click a button to download a song than to drive to the nearby record store, stand in line, buy a CD that might cost $20 that has the track on it that you want and a bunch of other garbage. And, uh, you know, when you introduce a service like the iTunes store, where you make everything available and easy to get at a dollar a pop, a substantial majority of people are going to do the right thing and pay the dollar to get the song that they want, especially if you can guarantee that the track is, is a quality encoding. Uh, I'm sure you remember all of those like 96 kilobit per second MP3s that just sounded like a song playing out of a tin can. I mean, they were they were awful. And the same thing needs to happen for games. Uh, if Nintendo is really serious about cracking down on piracy, they need to offer an alternative that gets the end user what they want. Um, you know, what does the end user want? They want access to every game in the library, not just a chosen few that rotate in and out of availability. And either make it a streaming service like a Netflix for games or make it a pay per title scheme. But if you do that, you know, make it an impulse buy level. 99 cents was a genius stroke by Apple because that's just like, you know, you can buy a can of pop and a vending machine or you can buy this song. It's an impulse buy. So there's lots of lessons to learn from the way that the iTunes store, you know, was, was developed. Things that the music industry absolutely hated at the time, but it ultimately saved them from insolvency. Yeah, um, it's it's easy to forget just how much time has passed since those original iPods and, and the iTunes library then came out following that. Uh, and so we are all a little bit wiser to the process as, as time's gone on. I, I've owned an iPod. I owned the very first generation iPod oh. in the past. Um, I've had Spotify, but the bulk of my music listening still comes from good old fashioned MP3s, which I ripped from my original CD library or I bought and then downloaded because we've all learned how convenience is presented at the door of a service like, uh, let's say, Amazon Music. But before long, that door is closed 
and then you're trapped within the walled garden um if you want to use your music in a way that they don't want you to tough luck sign up to another service and then buy the music again mm-hmm. uh, and the same applies to classic game roms the games aren't going to change you know these are 30 20 30 year old games so they're not going to change the only way the only thing that will change is the way that you play them and so the cynic in me says that the goal is to see how many times you can be sold the exact same thing whether that's on an online service or if that's in a mini arcade cabinet or however they want to keep selling this to you yeah and we we saw um, that with the we saw that with the virtual arcade or the in, on the wii you know they had the whole virtual console thing and when you bought your switch did all of those games come with you heck no oh, and no. i'm pretty sure that they've, they've, <laughs> they've shut down that service and you're screwed so yeah i mean you're you're right of course it is that the companies are going to be squeezing their very last dollar out of whatever service that they get and that includes forced obsolescence um maybe the the idea of a streaming service is what you want because you're paying a monthly fee but at least you don't have the guilt of losing any physical or you know digital downloads that you've gotten when you do upgrade to a new console but it it is a tough question you're absolutely right yeah but then on the flip side, if it's a 99 cent price point, will people care? Is it just throw away? You know, you, you've mm-hmm. got your entertainment out of it. Does it matter that it? Right. you have to pay it again if you want to play it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think we can all agree that whoever created these games originally, um, they're probably not getting their reward. Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't know how many 80s game devs are getting royalties from ROMs sold or, or would get ro- royalties on an online service. Uh, ethically i would wager a bet that there are a lot of people like me who pirated games as a kid who'd be more than happy to pay for these games once and for all um but only once perhaps you know in, mm-hmm. in the knowledge that the right people are rewarded and then we can use it however we want to use it i'd love to see a service along those lines but until then i think i might just keep buying my games on ebay john uh, dipping into my archive of locally stored roms and um you know uh, playing legally of course because i've absolutely. got boxed copies absolutely of them. <laughs> yeah every single rom Don't... ripped from a cartridge yes exactly despite what amiga aaron tells us to do yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm eager to hear about amigo aaron's thoughts in fact all of our listeners thoughts on this so uh stay tuned for this to pop up on our community question of the week and uh thank you to starcade 2084 for submitting this story to our show subreddit John, it's been another amazing month in the C64 community. Whether you're into new ports of arcade classics like Space Panic or entirely new gaming experiences like Gyro Run, the C64 homebrew scene has it all. But what if you're on the other side of the coin and you're a programmer looking to break into the market with your own custom cartridges? It sounds to me like you need to start stockpiling EEPROM cartridges to burn your newly minted game onto. And there's no better place to pick those up than over at RetroRewind.ca. Combine one of those with a custom plastic molded case and you can start manufacturing your dream game for less than 10 bucks a pop. And that's not all. If you use the promo code TWIR10 at checkout, you can save 10% on this or any order. Thank you to RetroRewind.ca for sponsoring this week's episode. The Super Nintendo is getting wider, John, and perhaps screams on live streams of you're playing it in the wrong aspect ratio will become a thing of the past because classic SNES games or SNES games for Americans, that's what you say over there, isn't it? Thank you, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, SNES games, SNES games are getting overhauled with widescreen support. Aside from flat screen versus CRTs, the evolving aspect of TV screens is a very obvious one when you enjoy classic games. At worst, your game is stretched out and you end up with rectangular pixels instead of square ones. At best, the games are in the correct aspect ratio and you have wasted space either side of your game screen. Or if you're a real pro, you might have set it up to have an image perhaps of the arcade bezel around the game area. But this all takes a bit of configuration And ultimately, it's not game space. It's just other stuff. It's fluff Mm -hmm. around your game. But now there's another option. This was teased back in March with a tweet from at Hacker Vilela. Hacker Vilela. We'll put a link in the show notes to to his uh, Twitter account. And he said, what if Super Mario World was optimized to run at widescreen 16 by 9? And he teased us with a video of the game running in widescreen. So, of course... Um, a lot more tiles from the tile set were being shown on the edge of the screen. You had a much wider game field 
and much more early warning when you were playing it of what's coming up on the game, what you're going to be tackling next. This was achieved through the BSNES HD fork of the BSNES emulator, which has handily now been integrated with RetroArch to um, give you a nice easy configuration to get up and running through that front end. So we've seen Super Mario World in, uh, in widescreen. There's also footage of F-Zero in widescreen. So that's a Mode 7 game. So it works with that. Um, it's not perfect. I did see some artifacting on the very edges of the screen. But the developer mentioned that in the video and just said, you know, working on fixing that. So it's early days, but it works with the Mode 7 games. Um, and it's pretty exciting, if you ask me. It's really exciting to see this. Now, John, I was going to ask you what game you'd like to see in widescreen on the SNES lineup, but I can't really think of any titles that wouldn't benefit from this, to be honest. I'm, I'm thinking I'd like to play Desert Strike, um, that isometric helicopter game. I'd love to see more of the game as I'm flying around. Maybe some Ninja Warriors. That was a game that was three monitors wide in the arcades. It's quite a different game on the on the SNES compared to the arcade, but it would still give it more of an arcade feel if you just widened it up a little bit. Um, yeah, can you think of anything you'd especially like to try in widescreen, John? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that Desert Strike is a, a, it's an amazing pick because you're constantly getting shot by stuff off screen in that game and being able to widen out your field of view would make that a lot less annoying. Um, I'd also love to try out the Adams Family in widescreen mode just to see what that would be like. Uh, I think for any type of platformer, it it could it could do nothing but enhance the gameplay experience because you can see, like you said, you can see more of the field, you can see more of what's coming up. Uh, but for people that are ROM hackers, there are endless possibilities with what you could do with those previously unseen edges of the screen. I'm thinking about when you're playing something like Madden, you could actually uh, widen out the uh, the sides of the screen to give you an animated crowd moving around. And this, these wouldn't be you know big changes, but it would be an alternative to just a static bezel i guess is what i'm saying so um bigger crowds and sports games you could have additional scenery and role-playing games there's really a million cool ways to improve existing games here i think yeah extra gaming girth is welcome by all i think that, that sounds like uh, an ad i've seen on one of those rom websites now <laughs> <laughs> click here for more gaming girth <laughs> You know, I can't think of any reason technically why this widescreen hack would be exclusive to SNES emulators. I'd like to see it appear on other emulators as an option, or even in MAME. You know, I'd love to play Ghosts and Goblins in widescreen, but the actual arcade version and not a home port. Or maybe we can see the arcade version of Sega Rally or, or Daytona made wider in the arcade version. There's probably home ports that have come out that, that are widescreen. I'm, I'm sure someone will tell me which versions there are that do that. But it'd be lo lovely to play the original arcade ROMs mm -hmm. widened out. Um, thinking back, I think the first experience of widescreen gaming I had, if we put aside the triple screen arcades like Hard Driving or Ninja Warriors, because that's kind of cheating, um, it would be the PlayStation 2 when I got my first widescreen CRT television. And that was largely justified by the same reason that many people had for buying the ps2 it was a cheap dvd player mm. where dvd players were very expensive so i could watch widescreen movies via the console on my on my trinitron widescreen crt uh can you remember your first widescreen gaming setup well i i definitely had a widescreen capable console before i had a widescreen tv um I want to say it wasn't until something like 2011 or something ridiculous like that that I actually hooked up my 360 to an, a widescreen TV for the first time. I never had a widescreen CRT, so I had to wait until you know the flat panel, the LCD TVs became affordable. And when that happened, uh, I was still living overseas. So when I came back, uh, that was the first thing that I bought because I was like, man, these things are cheap now. And so I, I hooked that up. And of course, when I hooked up the PlayStation 2, I was able to go back and replay a bunch of games in widescreen. So yeah, uh, I was I was a little late to the party there. What, what was the uptake of widescreen TVs like in the US? Did everyone go for it when well I, I remember there was a i don't remember seeing i think i saw one widescreen crt in my life 
Um, you know, right. And, but there was that time period where you had those funky, you know, rear projection HDTVs when, when HDTVs first came out and those things weighed as much as a boat anchor. And, and I knew several people that had those. Uh, but I think the majority of people didn't start to adopt them. I would say well into the 2010s. Uh, in 2008, there was sort of a, uh, the, that's when people started to broadcast an HD signal. Um, and I think that, you know, when the analog signals finally died, uh, people started to switch over. So I, I would say the early 2010s. Was it about the same time in the UK or was it before? Well, as I say, I, I bought my Sony Trinitron. It was a 24-inch widescreen television mm -hmm. uh, when the PlayStation 2 launched. Oh, my, so yeah, really, really, so really early like on. 2001. Wow. I don't know that that was particularly common, but, you know, it was a Sony, a big brand. There were plenty of them in the shops. Sure. It took time for people to get them into their homes, but... Um, yeah, do you remember paying a, what do you remember paying a premium for just having a widescreen versus a normal four by three at the time? Oh yeah, you would have paid a lot more for it, and it was mm -hmm. a Sony Trinitron, so you you paid the. You're Trinitron paying more anyway, tax. yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I'd got my first. Uh, no, it was my second job, um, mm. and you know, I just the paychecks were coming in, and I wanted to treat myself. So sure, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you got your money's worth out of that that TV. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, yeah, and, and and thinking about it, the, the PlayStation Two was, I say, the first widescreen TV I had with it. But I did go back to a four by three with the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, so I kind of fluctuated a bit according to my circumstances mm. at the time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, widescreen Super Nintendo gaming, it's here, it's a thing, it's being very rapidly developed um, in that community, and I'm watching with great interest to see what games we'll be able to enjoy in it next. And all the links, as usual, are in the show notes. Neil, as a full-time YouTuber who's made your fair share, I'd say, of Trash to Treasure videos, I think you realize more than most that uh, the vital role that hardware preservation plays, you know, in, in, the, in the retro community. Uh, do you have a favorite restoration project that you've done over the years? They're all my babies, John. Yeah, <laughs> it's really I understand. difficult to pick a favorite. Um, it tends to be the rarer machines that I find more rewarding just because you feel even more so that you've preserved something that's in short supply. So something like the Amstrad Mega PC, which are quite hard to pick up these days, um, which had uh, leakage and corrosion on the board, to know that you've picked it up at the point where if something wasn't done, then, then that was going in the bin. And we've got it in time and we've got it fixed. And we're going to have it on display here for people to use. That feels really special. So the rarer, the better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but something that sometimes escapes the eye of even retro enthusiasts like ourselves is the often thankless work of software preservation. Um, after all, lots of people own the machines that are meticulously, well, that's a tough word to say, meticulously restored to their former glory. But oftentimes the software that's lost to the mist of time is on the more obscure side. But that, of course, doesn't make it any less worthy of preservation, and that's the subject of our next story. As you know, the world of arcade machines in the early 80s was incredibly crowded. Uh, the likes of Pac-Man and Space Invaders had opened the floodgates to a panoply of titles, some new and original, and some brazen copies of proven formulas. Uh, one of the biggest manufacturers of coin ops during this time was a now mostly forgotten company called Universal. Uh, headquartered in Tokyo, Universal brought over to the West some of my favorite arcade machines of all time, including the highly influential Space Panic, which was later kind of reskinned and converted to home computers, is a little game we know as Load Runner. Uh, Ladybug was another Universal game, and uh, the Mr. Do franchise, which uh, the third game in the series, Do Run Run, it's my favorite arcade game of all time. Uh, Neil, have you spent any time with Universal arcade games? I have, and it's interesting that this story it kind of dovetails a little bit with the talk earlier about piracy, mm. because mm -hmm. when is preservation piracy? Is a yeah. <laughs> there's a. I'm not going to start trying to unwrap that right now, but there's a lot of crossover between preservation and piracy. Absolutely. Uh, on the Universal game specifically, I remember the Universal cabinets had a very distinctive design. Um, I really like them. There's a definite 1970s hangover to the style of some of their early 80s cabs, which I do enjoy. I don't remember specific Universal cabinets in my local arcades, to be honest. We did have games like Mr. Do, so we had the Universal games. 
but they were in more ge generic cabinets and, and jammer cabinets and things like that when I was at the arcade. So I can't say for certain if I saw one back in the day, John. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I love the design of the uh, the, the Universal Cabs. I, I never saw a Universal Cab back in the day in the wild, but I did have an opportunity to buy one at an auction. I went to an arcade auction, but I came home with the Mario Brothers instead. I think on the whole, I, I made the right choice. That's uh, not bad. Yeah. Um, but uh, one thing Universal Cabs have going for them is they their bulking size uh even by arcade machine standards the universal cabs they're just they're massive uh i think they're a couple inches taller and the depth of those cabinets is insane they have a a, a separate section on the top that kind of on a diagonal up that has some additional artwork that you didn't really see on arcade cabs they look really unique and like you said they have that 70s beige color with the with the fonts and everything and so um but one title universal developed that didn't quite make it to the limelight uh, is a is a game called Mrs. Dynamite, and this comes to us from a story shared by subreddit user Starcade twenty eight oh four again, or twenty twenty eighty four. Sorry. Uh, so Mrs. Dynamite, what is it? Uh, this is an overhead maze, avoid the enemies type game, kind of like Pac Man, kinda, um, but it has its own particular spin on it that you um you pick up. Uh, you guessed it, sticks of dynamite that you drop in front of the bad guys to defeat them. Now. Apparently, this machine was actually manufactured in small quantities. Uh, sales uh, flyers were printed, and a few cabinets were actually uh, delivered to test locations in 1982. But for whatever reason, uh, most likely because in 1982, uh, the arcade world was probably getting tired of overhead maze-type games. Uh, the game never ramped up to full-scale production. Uh, unfortunately... The tale of how this game was found and who actually dumped the ROMs has not been revealed yet. And, and w the way that these go, sometimes you never know because people acquire these things through, I don't want to say nefarious means, but they, they have their ways, let's say. Uh, but the good news is that overall, Mrs. Dynamite is out there. It's playable. Neil, have you given it a shot yet? What do you think of Mrs. Dynamite? Uh, I haven't played it, but I did look up. Well, I looked it up, and the first hit was um, a streamer called Mame Haze on YouTube who mm -hmm. was playing it. So very quickly got hold of this and tried it out. So I watched them play it, and it's all very familiar, isn't it? There, there's definite shades of Pac-Man, of course. There's music that's very kind of Mr. Do, mm -hmm. very reminiscent of Mr. Do's mm -hmm. Ditty, and there's a definite Bomberman mechanic to it. Um, now I, I did some digging because uh, I was uncertain as to if this was the first time we'd seen that kind of mechanic in an arcade game. And um, what I found that was that while Bomberman did appear on sale later than Mrs. Dynamite came out, Bomberman did first appear in 1980 as part of a Hudson Soft basic programming package. And Bomberman was a sample game in there to help you to learn the language. So Bomberman did come before Mrs. Dynamite. And I, I do wonder if the name of the game is an unsubtle nod to its inspiration you know bomber man mrs dynamite it can't be a coincidence can it john <laughs> you know i had no idea that the roots of Bomberman stretched back that far. So good work on your uh, your your investigation, Neil. Uh, I guess it's it, it definitely is possible. Uh, but of course, ideas in gaming are sometimes invented in tandem, independent of each other. Sort of like sure. how flight was pioneered independently on both sides of the Atlantic at around the same time in history, with no you know people on both sides having no idea that the other was doing it. Uh, there's still so much unknown to us here in the West about the history of Japanese game development, though. Uh, maybe there is a connection there that has yet to be revealed. So, if you're a fan of old-school arcade machines and recent discoveries in the world of software preservation, uh, you can check out Mrs. Dynamite for yourself at the link in the show notes. Neil, last week's community question of the week was, why do you think classic micros are underrepresented in the speedrunning community? And we got some answers, Neil. We got some answers. Potato Professor says, because they're expensive to acquire and can be tricky to maintain. They also have esoteric command lines and require peripherals. Uh, they're also typically not appealing to younger generations who grew up on Nintendo consoles. And also, speedrun contests usually don't allow emulators. I think all three of those are excellent answers, don't you, Neil? Oh, very valid points, yeah. And that's without even touching on load times. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. Um the uh let's see croc came and says speed running was actually invented on the pc with doom and quake so i don't believe that it's about complexity alone 
Here's some pure unsubstantiated speculation. Whereas Europe had the demo scene, Amiga has or America has speedrunning. Unlike European users creating content on their micros, console-centric America found a way to make content on platforms where they weren't given the tools to make their own content. IMO, this is why game streaming and speedrunning is predominantly American and console-based. Interesting take. Hmm, I'm pretty sure people were trying to play games through games as quickly as possible before Doom and Quake, you know, the, mm-hmm. the NES generation. They must have been doing that, but perhaps the name speedrunning hadn't stuck yet. Yeah, but yeah, maybe it, so. It, it was a thing. I know that there were definitely world records for uh, for Super Mario Brothers that, that go back beyond those two games. But like you said, sure. the, the actual term speedrunning might have been coined with those PC games. And the ability in game to actually record your your go at it, yeah, you know, things like that. Yeah, and finally, Pajako sixty five zero two says, I think it's a combination of micros having way more games available, and given most of us could simply move on to another copy disc or tape when one game didn't tick any boxes. Very few got the repeat playtime that something like Super Mario does. And let's be honest, many a game on micros weren't silky smooth to play at that level. What do you think about that, Neil? I think home micro users would simply more sane than console owners. That's what it comes down to. You're all mental. <laughs> You're probably right. You're probably right. So uh, thank you to everyone that submitted answers to our community question of the week on, on our subreddit. This week's community question is whether streaming or a la carte, what would persuade you to buy into a retro gaming ecosystem? So... Please post your responses in the subreddit, and we'll read the top three most upvoted responses on the air next week. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC and John Shawler. It was produced by me, Duncan Stiles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favorite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you'd like to support the show, please check out the links to our Patreon and Coffee pages in the show notes or in the YouTube description. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.